Hello class, let's get started on our week four content. Week four, we will only have one lecture pre-recorded this week, and instead of having our second lecture, we will have exam one. Exam one will not include the material covered today on marketing of horses. Exam one will include safe handling of horses and their behavior, history of the horse, characteristics of breeds, anatomy, and confirmation. So there will be five different lectures that will be covered on exam one. The exam is going to be made up of 33 questions, a couple of true and false, fill in the blanks. Most of them are free response. So for example, explaining the difference between a dominant and recessive trait or explaining the difference between a tendon and a ligament. Um, you may also identify different conformational flaws or different anatomical parts of the horse. So that's primarily how the exam is going to be laid out. Um, this is an online class. I know you're gonna use your notes. I know you're gonna use your resources to take your exam. I'm not gonna ask you not to do that. That being said, I am going to limit the amount of time you have to take the exam to one hour. If you're familiar with content, you've watched the lectures, you've read through your notes a couple of times, you've made notes, you'll have absolutely no problem completing that in one hour. Once we get through the first exam, I see how you all do um, with that time limit, so on and so forth, then likely the second exam will lay, be laid out similarly, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So that's just a little bit of information on how exam one is going to be laid out. So make sure you're prepared and getting ready for that. As for this lecture, which is on marketing of horses, I know the first week that we met for class, we went over the syllabus and there is a group project worth 25 points and it does relate to marketing. So we do have a couple of horses at the farm that are no longer able to service the program for various reasons. So we need to market these horses to market these horses outside um, other individuals within the industry so that we can find them new homes and move them to new facilities. So that's what that is what our marketing project is going to be. When we meet for lab this week, we will get to meet those horses that need to be marketed elsewhere and get started on the marketing, pro marketing project. That being said, it's why I want to introduce marketing of horses. Look at what is the current horse sale economics, what are current issues that we're having, or how does the industry lay currently. Look at why marketing is important within the equine industry. Hit on 12 basic tips to consider when selling horses and then how to ensure that our horse is receiving a good home. Obviously, there's not just the seller side of this, but learning how to market horses effectively, you can also benefit from being a buyer. So important to consider marketing of horses from both standpoints. When looking at the current horse sale economics, I'm going to pull a couple of statistics from a 2013 publication from Utah State University. It is Horse Marketing Answer and Options, an article by Jim Keyes, who is an area animal scientist. Marketing horses in today's world can be very difficult. Since 2006, Congress has prohibited the use of federal funds to inspect horses destined for food, effectively prohibiting domestic slaughter. Due to the forced closure of horse slaughter plants in the U.S., many horse marketing options have been eliminated or severely depressed. So the closure of those facilities has decreased the market value for horses as we have an increase in population and an increase in the amount of unwanted horses. So I know I previously talked about early on how a lot of people will say that horse slaughter is illegal in the United States, and that's not true. 
you could legally slaughter horses. However, there is no federal funding to inspect the plant. If there's no federal funding to inspect a slaughter facility, then they can't be open for operation. So just a little loophole and haul and how all of the slaughter facilities within the United States for horses were shut down. I'm not here to tell you that we need to reopen or we need to completely make it illegal. Um, that is an opinion to each their own. However, I think looking through a couple of articles and personal experience and going to sales of recent, it's important that we do consider that even though we're not slaughtering horses within the U.S., that doesn't mean that kill buyers aren't still going to um, local sales, even here in Bowling Green. Um, kill buyers are coming to sales they're purchasing horses and they're transporting them across the U.S. border to be slaughtered in other countries. When we close down slaughter facilities in the U.S., then we lose control on how many hours those horses can travel in a trailer, how frequently they have to stop for water, and so on and so forth. So by closing facilities here, I'm not sure that that didn't create a welfare issue in a different direction. Not to say one way is right or the other, but multiple welfare issues of concern in either regard. Most notably, with the ceasing of domestic horse slaughter is the drop in value of mid to low range horses. Since 2007, the value of lower to medium priced horses has decreased by 8 to 21%. In the recent past, horses that would have brought Five to six hundred dollar for slaughter prices can now be cannot be even be given away. So as the number of unwanted horses rises, it's difficult to even give away horses. And many livestock auctions will not even receive horses for sale. So this being said, we've created a welfare issue in a different direction. Sometimes it's been noted that horses are being taken out into the country and turned loose um, like they're a stray kitten. Many brand inspectors, fairgrounds managers, and ranchers are reporting more and more unwanted horses are showing up in strange places. Local government and animal welfare organizations have reported a rise in abandonment of horses since 2007. This type of auction or this type of you know, ridding yourself of the horse doesn't benefit anyone, especially not the horse that's involved. For decades, weekly or bi-weekly horse auctions flourished around the country. However, today many of those sale venues have been closed down due to the decrease in value of lower priced horses. That being said, you know, what can someone do if the soaring cost of feed and fuel make it necessary for them to cut back on the number of horses they own or completely liquidate? The answer to this question depends mainly on the classification of horse that is being marketed. If the horse is extremely old or in poor health, the options for marketing that animal may be limited or even non-existent. We... I'm sure you all have seen, you know, horses marketed on Facebook and those posts are often flagged now. But there are a couple of different horse um, advertising websites. But in, a dip, in addition to this option would be, in addition to that option, would be to contact one of many horse rescue groups that are taking in horses that are no longer needed or wanted. In these groups, you can do a quick Google search and find local rescues. There's a number in the U.S. and even a number in Kentucky and locally near Bowling Green. However, if someone has a mid to high range horse to be marketed, the options then expand somewhat. The use of classified ads and private treaty is still an option. And there are still many consignment horse sales being held around the country. These are often annual or semi-annual auctions that provide a forum for horse owners to market their animals. These can range from highly exclusive breed sales to all breed open sales where any type of horse is welcome. 
all of that being said, I know myself, I've been to a couple of sales in Texas and in Missouri this year. And it does appear that market value of horses has increased um, this year, this season, comparatively to last year. So maybe we are in the upturn. Uh, maybe we are seeing improvements in industry. It'll definitely take us some time to observe and see how the economics in the industry are changing from year to year. In a perfect world, we may be able to keep all of our horses, all the horses we raise on our farm. But ultimately, before even getting into why marketing matters, I want to make note that the horse industry is not for the faint of heart. It's a capital and work investment industry to raise and train horses. There is certainly a lot of unknowns and risk, and it takes an incredible amount of commitment, patience, and time. It essentially takes three to four years from the time you pick out a stallion and a mare to breed before you even know the quality of the cross that you're choosing. And then, of course, there's the exponential amount of variables. However, despite all of these challenges and hardships, and it, it is an industry that is growing and becoming even more competitive. So what makes some programs successful while others struggle? In previous years, you could almost let the results and the offspring speak for themselves. However, in recent years, it is you could certainly make note in recent years that the more successful operations market themselves. With the heightened competitive environment, there are too many options in the same league to not appropriately market your stock and your operation. That being said, we're going to hit on four main reasons why it is becoming even more important in today's day and age to have a sophisticated marketing strategy for your equine program. So these are going to look at the broad spectrum of marketing your program and then we'll dig deeper into just marketing or selling one individual horse. So this is not going to apply to marketing our horses out of the equine center at Western, but it's important to consider when evaluating marketing your program, whether it be for training or breeding or selling horses. To begin with, managed correctly, marketing yields a greater return on investment. It is expensive to stand a stallion, raise, or train horses. So how do you intend to advertise to get the greatest return for your investment? Do you want the best mares, the best clients, endorsements, or do you want to sell your horses for the highest value? Regardless of what your emphasis is, you need to plan to reach and target an attractive audience. For example, um, social media is a great outlet and is commonly used in marketing. But did you know that 95% of potential clients will actually Google your farm website before doing business with you? Ensuring that you have a website that is updated and that it has current horses listed so you don't want it to be outdated. So it's very important when looking at how marketing will yield a greater return on your investment. Next, we want to consider um, marketing and how it clarifies your operational goals to the public. Marketing involves sharing your specific goals so you can do business with people that are like-minded. When you are intentional and make it very clear and public on what you're aiming to accomplish, you will attract people with the same goals. This improves your likelihood of achievement. So for example, if you're raising prospects, what specific attributes have you selectively bred for in your program? Are you actively advertising these specific attributes? Do you do something that differentiates yourself from other operations or competitors? Maybe it is the extent to which you handle and halter break your yearlings so that they will be more trainable. You want your clients to know and value what you value because then you will be more, then they will be more willing to pay for what it is that you are working to achieve. 
Third, we want to make sure that marketing articulates your story. This might be the most crucial element to having a marketing strategy for an equine business. So much commitment, energy, and dedication goes into building a program. Most people put a tremendous amount of thought into what they do and why they do it, and there is a wide range of options and thoughts. Whatever you are doing, you do it because you believe in it. If you want to be successful, you need other people to believe in this as well. So how are you sharing that message? If you want other people to invest in what you are doing, they have to understand and buy into it. This is why clinics have been helpful for building businesses for trainers. Um, for example, Clinton Anderson and Fallon Taylor have certainly bought into clinicians and building businesses for themselves. They have done a great job of gaining a following audience by putting themselves, their knowledge, and their story in front of people. For those not comfortable or who have not had the opportunity for something such as a clinic, consider making a professional video of your operation or stallion to personalize what your program is about. And next we have marketing and making sure that you're showcasing success. And this is how do you let people know when your program is getting the results that you have worked so hard for? This can be difficult and tricky waters to tread as you never want to appear as arrogant. However, you do want people to know what you endorse and that what you have done is working. You should never be ashamed or shy when dedicating leads to success, but do it in a manner that you want reflective of your individual values and program. For example, if you're a trainer, you're selling your talent. If you're a breeder, you're selling your genetics. However, this, um, I've noticed that there's a lot of great trainers as well as genetics, but you need to make sure that you're separating your program out from others. Everyone is working hard, and there becomes a point in time where hard work alone will not produce a profitable business. And it's important to do business smart, and part of smart business is a strong marketing strategy. And so that being said, we see why marketing matters for a barn that's doing lessons or a barn that is boarding horses or standing stud. And then we'll follow this up and we'll look at specific tips on marketing an individual horse. Now we're going to roll through 12 quick tips for selling a horse. The first thing we want to make sure that our horse is showroom ready. Buying a horse is certainly a logical decision, but it's also an emotional one. And who can resist a pretty equine specimen? This would include a glossy coat, a tidy mane and tail, new shoes, and top physical condition. So our glossy coat, that's going to go into ensuring that they have proper nutrition. Our tidy mane and tail, that they're properly maintained. New shoes can set a horse up very nicely. Um, it shows that they're well maintained and also shows that we're actively using and taking care of that animal. Um, top physical condition, that horse is set and ready to go. It's ready to enter the show arena. It's ready to hit the trails. This horse is prepped and ready for their new owner. This would ensure that the buyer gets to see this horse at its best. The second tip to is ensure that you're taking great photos. Getting a standout photo is top priority before marketing a horse. You have just a split second to capture someone's attention with a photo. It's important to get photos that show the horse's spark. In selecting different types of photos to include, you should strive to get an attractive and expressive headshot with the horse's ears up and looking alert, as well as a side body confirmation shot, again with the horse looking alert. Then it's important that you also include photographs of this horse riding if it is a horse that can be ridden and that has received training to do so. In riding a horse, it's important that you have photos of them at various gates 
such as the trot and the canner. I know most of us, we have a smartphone in our pocket. It's easy to pull that out and snap a couple of photographs, but it's important that we make sure that these photos aren't distorted. Um, a horse that has a very nice back can look long-backed when distorted, or a horse that has a nice proportionate, balanced, well put together, if a mare, a feminine head, um, could end up looking like they have a moose head that's very large and when distorted. So keep in mind, if you are using a smartphone, make sure that those photographs aren't distorted when selecting photos. A couple of tips of advice to make sure that you have good photographs is to stand about 20 feet from the horse to try and avoid as much distortion as possible and make sure the camera is parallel with the horse, not pointed up or down. And again, this is going to help to prevent distortion. You can then edit the photo and crop the images so that the horse fills the entire frame. It's also a good idea to shoot photographs outside with the sun behind you to eliminate the horse as morning and evening light are going to be the best time to avoid shadows on the legs which may be cast by trees, buildings, or even the photographer. As for tip number three, it's equally as important to get a great quality video as well as photograph. So a photo can initially capture a potential buyer's attention, but a video can show off the horse's gates and training, and frequently this is what's going to seal the deal for requesting an in-person visit. It's important that you don't make the videos too long or you risk losing the viewer's attention. A video should be two to three minutes long, max, long enough to show the horse's walk, trot, and canter in each direction. Four minutes would, would be pushing it, but four minutes maybe if the horse does any upper level movements. If a horse is an excellent trail horse, it's important that you show footage of her, him or her being ridden through a gate or expertly navigated through different obstacles, such as logs or over water. Um, another example would be if you're selling a reining horse to show him doing a sliding stop, lead changes, or spins. So just a couple of things to consider when putting together a good quality video. Step number four is to write a concise and accurate description of the horse. A great photo is the first thing that will catch a potential buyer's attention, and the video takes the interest a step further. But following the imagery with an honest yet short written assessment of the horse is beneficial. Ensure that you have correct details including characteristics of the horse, such as the age or the year of birth, the height, and when applicable, registration information. In addition to this, you want to include the horse's breeding or pedigree, information on their personality, training, their show record, if any, and potential. Tip number five is to ensure that you're setting a fair price for the horse. Pricing your horse appropriately can make or break a sale. If you price a horse too high, then you risk losing time and credibility. If you price a horse too low, then you might leave money on the table. It's important to base a horse's price on the horse's training, temperament, talent, breeding, and soundness as buyers are look, truly looking for the full package. Setting a good price doesn't mean getting on a horse um, classified site and looking up comparable horses for sale, but instead you need to know what prices the horses are actually selling for. Because a listing price and a negotiated final price isn't necessarily going to be the same thing. If you aren't using a horse broker to broker to assist in setting a price, then it may be beneficial to talk to a trainer who works within your discipline or within your breed who has recently helped buy or sell horses. Um, in some cases, it can even be beneficial to pay a trainer or a professional 
for their time to evaluate your horse and suggest a price. Tip number six is to locate your target market. When listing your horse on marketing and sales sites, it's important to consider who's on that specific website and what kind of horse that he or she may be looking for. For example, a quarter horse breed show competitor likely isn't looking on a warm bloods for sale site for his or her next Western pleasure mount. It's important that you choose the site that's appropriate for your horse, his discipline, as well as the price point. It's important that you also don't forget to promote your horse for sale via social media outlets, such as on Facebook groups targeted towards your horse's market. For number seven, we wanna make sure that we organize, or in some cases, that we find and locate all of a horse's paperwork. Before buyers begin to show up to ride horses or examine them or even do the final purchase, it's important that you make sure that you have all of your horse's paperwork organized and in one place. This can include registration papers but is not limited to only registration papers. It could also be DNA test results, show results, veterinary records, and any production records if they have any foals um, or so on and so forth. When we're looking at vet records, it's important that horses have a negative Coggins test, um, but this can also be inclusive of if this horse has any maintenance that needs to be routinely done if you have any veterinary record of that, which we will further discuss um, once we get down to number 10. So just keep that one on hold and we'll discuss it a little bit further here later on. Number eight, we want to ensure that we're capitalizing on the initial listing that we're making of a horse. The first three months of marking a horse is full of excitement and interest. So this is going to be the prime time when this horse is new to the listing and you're gonna get the most attention in those first three months. After that time period, attention normally tends to wane as new projects are coming along, new prospects are coming along and people may also start wondering why that horse hasn't sold yet. Is it overpriced? Is it difficult to ride? Did it not pass a vet check? Um, and this is how rumors get started in the horse world. And those rumors could ruin a sale or scare off potential buyers. It's important to take advantage of your initial listing by promoting the horse via social media sites, posting flyers at appropriate venues and horse events, such as horse shows or 4-H clinics if it were to be a kid's horse, and spreading word about this horse's availability through industry contacts. If you receive little or no interest, you may consider reevaluating the horse's price and your marketing methods. It may be a signal um, that you need to ask for assistance from a professional as well. Tip number nine, ensure that you are responsive to potential buyers. Selling a horse can take a lot of time and energy, and a lot of that can be attributed to answering the many, many questions that buyers have prior to come and seeing a horse in person. You have to have the time to respond to those emails, phone calls, and text. A missed correspondence could mean a missed sale. If you don't have the time to actively field calls and questions from potential buyers, then it may be helpful to seek the assistance of a professional. As for number 10, it's important that you disclose any health or training issues that a horse has. I know a lot of times we think about, well, this horse is for sale because it has issues or it needs maintenance or, you know, there's something wrong with it. There's a reason that, that someone else wants to part with it, find it a new location. And sometimes this is true and sometimes this is not. That being said, if 
as a seller, if you want your horse to have a new home, you want to ensure that it is a good home, it's important that you're honest in disclosing any health and training issues. I like to, to do for others as I would want them um, to do for me, so I think that that's important when we're going through with selling a horse is to disclose any health or training issues that they may have. Legally, as a seller, you should share anything important you know about the horse's behavior and physical condition. This could include lameness history, any maintenance that is required to keep the horse sound. So if they're continuously needing to get injections in their hocks to remain sound, or if they require a special type of shoeing, for example. These are different required maintenance items that you would want to disclose. If they have any stereotypes, such as cribbing or weaving when in the stall, if you have any results that you've received back from genetic testing that they may be a carrier or have a genetic disease, if a stallion or colt has one or more um, testicles that hasn't dropped, and if they have any history of bucking, rearing, spooking, kicking, biting, or other dangerous behaviors. When in doubt, it's important to disclose information. And I also recommend that potential buyers get a pre-purchase veterinary exam on the horse from an independent veterinarian. So you don't want to use whoever is selling the horse. You don't want to use their vet. You want to make sure that you have an unbiased opinion. In addition to a pre-purchase exam, it may be beneficial um, to get the seller's authorized vet to release records to the buyer. And the reason behind that is once the seller has fully disclosed what they know about an issue, then it is on the buyer to consider that in making a purchase decision. The seller's disclosure will protect the seller if the buyer is dissatisfied post-purchase because the horse is unsound, even if the horse is unsound because of a pre-existing condition. In addition, um, non-disclosure could lead a buyer to distrust a seller and walk away from a deal after a pre-purchase is performed. An example of this would include if the horse has had a colic surgery, but the, they chose not to tell the buyer. Oftentimes, a good vet will be able to locate a colic surgery scar um, during the exam. So, buyers often use a pre-purchase exam result as leverage to lower the price during negotiation. And by disclosing issues up front, then oftentimes buyers are going to be less surprised by less favorable pre-purchase results and more likely to pay your asking price or try to do with you less. Tip number 11 is to offer a safe place for riding and to get a signed release. If you're offering a horse that is trained or a riding age horse for sale, potential buyers are likely going to want to try the horse under saddle. To do so, it's important that you offer them a safe and preferably enclosed area or arena to ride. If you don't have an arena where you keep your horse, you may consider moving them to a boarding facility wall for sale or hauling them to a public arena or showgrounds in order for the potential buyer to ride and view them. The sellers should have everyone who comes to look at a horse sign a release form as this is true even for buyers who will not be riding as well as anyone who accompanies a prospective buyer as ground accidents are just as likely to cause an injury. Um, additionally, it's made note that most homeowner policy, insurance policies actually have exceptions for commercial activity. And this would mean that a normal homeowner's policy wouldn't cover, likely wouldn't cover any accidents involving a prospective horse buyer. So a couple of things to keep in mind when individuals are coming to your facility um, to to look at and potentially ride a horse for interest of purchasing. 
And finally, our final tip for our 12 tips for selling a horse is that once you've negotiated the sale to get your sales agreement in writing and have a clear plan for the transfer of funds and transport of the horse. Um, it's also recommended that you keep all email or text correspondence about the sale and use a sales contract that is drafted by a professional um, when doing the transaction of an equine. And once the sale is complete, then the buyer will be responsible for the horse's care from that point out. We've talked in detail on the current situation of the equine industry and how the economics of the country impact that. And then talked about marketing a facility as well as 12 tips to ensure a successful sale or a smooth sale and transaction. But we also want to ensure that the horse that we're selling is going to receive a good home. As a responsible seller, you want your horse to go to an appropriate home. And most horse people have heard a heartbreaking story about horses that were sold unknowingly to horse traders or feedlots. The best ways to avoid those scenarios are to advertise your horse honestly, ensure your horse gets a good home by making sure the new owner and the horse is a match, both in personality and ability, and facilitate that positive relationship by promoting a horse honestly. If you advertise the horse as a husband safe mount and he is not, then likely this isn't going to be a good home for this horse for very long. It will, you know, be passed down to another owner or another individual. Secondly, you want to ask for a reference from the buyer's veterinarian. A responsible horse owner will have a relationship with their vet by asking for the name of the buyer's vet and following up with a phone call. You should be able to get a good fill on the on the um, purchaser themselves then you want to find out where that horse is going to be located where are they going to be living at um, if it's a boarding facility that has a current relationship with the buyer then you could contact the owner or manager for a reference and if the buyer is keeping the horse at home then it would be appropriate um, to ask for photographs to discuss their facilities and so on and so forth. Um, a quick Google search of the buyer's name, you can often learn a fair amount. Um, if they are a, a leading person in industry or they do have a show record or if they have any animal cruelty charges, um, a quick Google search can tell you quite a bit on you know, a, a great person or a terrible person that you don't want to sell your horse to. So might miss a little bit in the middle, but you definitely see the highlights on both ends of the spectrum there. And then don't sell a horse at or below slaughter horse prices. While horse slaughter is not performed in the United States, the harsh reality is that many American horses are sold to contractors for slaughter in Canada and Mexico. So we touched on that a little bit in the introductory section of this lecture. These contractors pay a price per pound, which varies by location, the horse type, as well as condition. To make sure you don't unwillingly or unknowingly sell a horse to a meat buyer, check your local auction yards or online auctions to find current meat prices and then price your horse above that price point. A reputable equine rescue might also advise you on current um, per pound rates that horses are selling at. So ensuring that you're selling above that rate um, can be helpful in ensuring that your horse isn't going to end up in unwanted or hands that are, are going to harm them in the long run. That being said, at the completion of this lecture, you will be ready to complete week 4A assignment. When you come to lab this week, I will have a description on how you will be assessed for your group marketing project and how we plan to market the horses through the university. Um, since those horses are owned by the university, we want to make sure that we're following 
a couple of, of guidelines that the university has set and also that we're first marketing those horses to alumni and individuals who may already have a personal relationship with some of these horses that have been at the farm for an extended period of time. So that will complete our lecture for this week.